two stabs, I step in in the same way. Now my hand slides down, and where are we at? I've been teaching fighting techniques to government agencies for more than 15 years, including the US Marines, US Marshals, US SWAT teams, and US Navy SEALs. He's gonna stab me. I go here, and then I go here, and then I could go here or here. Nearly all the techniques I teach are banned in the sport of mixed martial arts. I can control the direction of the muzzle. You guys see that? These are some of the most effective and damaging moves you could use in a real life situation, be it in self-defense, here, on the street, or in war. Straight into the trachea. Now you're gonna knee, step back, and then rip. And the gun comes out. You're good. This is life or death for these guys. And I'm honored to share this knowledge. You see your muscles, James. You see your muscles. Oh, yes. Go on, do it again and again. That's right. That's it. Power. James, he was a very lively child, quite hard to control. <laughs> His teacher said to us, I'm finding it difficult to cope with him because he is so um, not aggressive. He is so lively, really. Lively, yes. I think that's probably the better word. So I took him to one of the training sessions of Kaikishinkai, which is a very hard style of karate. It's a bit more controlled and structured. It calmed him down. From then on, he took the karate to heart. Bruce Lee was his hero as a child, and he had big posters in his bedroom. Like a lot of boys, I dreamed about becoming a kung fu master who could fight off bad guys in any situation. But when I was a teenager, I got attacked on the street and beaten up, coming face to face with the reality that all those choreographed karate routines I'd spent years practicing were completely useless. Then I found out that the same thing happened to Bruce Lee when he was my age, launching him on a quest, the search for truth in combat. Lee went on to study a wide range of martial arts, taking only the best parts of each discipline. His philosophy was simple. Research your own experience. Absorb what is useful. Reject what is useless. Add what is specifically your own. Armed with this philosophy, I vowed to follow in Lee's footsteps. 15 years and five black belts later, I was given the opportunity to put my training to the test. Johnson is Wilkes in trouble. Is attacking. One hook in, and he's got the choke. He's got one arm across. Gets up and around now. He's going to die. Then, I got injured. I was sparring with a future heavyweight champion and tore ligaments in both of my knees. Unable to teach or train for at least six months, I spent more than a thousand hours studying peer-reviewed science on recovery and nutrition, looking for any advantage I could find to get back on track as quickly as possible. That's when I stumbled across a study about the Roman gladiators. The gladiator graveyard from Ephesus is the only one with a significant number of individuals buried there. Archaeologists recovered the remains of at least 68 gladiators. There have been more than 5,000 bones analyzed for the study. We found in the cross-section of the bone very high bone mineral density, which indicated intense training and high quality diet to build up strong muscles and strong bones. This diet gave the gladiators the nickname Hordiari, which means beans and barley muncher. We know different food sources give different amounts of strontium in the bones. High strontium levels in vegetarians, low strontium levels in carnivores. If there is low strontium in the sample, the flame will stay blue. If there is high strontium levels, it will change from blue to red. The gladiators were predominantly vegetarian. This totally blew my mind. 
The gladiators were highly prized fighters who got the most advanced training and medical care in the Roman Empire. To think that the original professional fighters ate mainly plants went against everything I'd been taught about nutrition. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Superman. <laughs> James, does Superman eat meat? Yes. He does? Yes. Oh. Could you tell us what sort of food you eat at tea time when you come home? Nearly the same as dinner, but um, egg and lamb chop. Do you think all the other children should eat those sort of foods? Yes. In order to get strong? Mm. Even in the UFC, this idea that meat makes you tough had become a focal point for one of the most anticipated fights in the history of the sport between Conor McGregor, the world champion in two different weight classes, and Nate Diaz, who accepted the fight with only 11 days notice after McGregor's original opponent pulled out. McGregor was a big meat eater. It's a steaks every day for me, steaks for breakfast, steaks for lunch, steaks for brunch, grass fed, massaged, beef, all day long. Diaz was on a plant-based diet. Eat your vegetables and McGregor had a field day with it. This man, let's see, let's see, can he fight? I'm a lion in there. Your little gazelle friends are gonna be staring through the cage looking at your carcass getting eaten alive. McGregor was feeding off a stereotype that was pretty much universal. <laughs> <laughs> you hit like a vegetarian. <laughs> I was curious to find out if there were any other elite athletes following a plant-based diet. The first I found was Scott Jurek one of the greatest ultra runners of all time. Scott built his career running extreme distances over brutal terrain, conquering the sport's most prestigious races, including the Badwater Ultra Marathon, 135 miles through California's Death Valley, with temperatures reaching 130 degrees. I was training for the Western States 100 mile race, which is like the Super Bowl of ultra marathon racing. And that's when I was transitioning to a plant-based diet. I remember doubting myself, even up to a week before the race, like maybe I should have eaten meat. But I led that race from start to finish and won it for seven years in a row. And there was no question that the plant-based diet was fueling my victories. When I met Scott, he was gearing up for the greatest challenge of his career. Invite me over. When I'm moving, I'm definitely gonna be eating. Having already mastered single day endurance events, Scott was now trying to become the fastest person ever to run the entire Appalachian Trail a distance of 2,200 miles. My goal is to break the record. 46 days, 11 hours. It's good to Maine. <laughs> Two marathons a day over technical terrain. Average of 11,000 feet of climbing and 11,000 feet of descent every day, back to back to back to back. It's completely beyond anything we've done before. As Scott hit the trail, I was confused about how his meat-free diet could possibly give him enough energy. So I reached out to Dr. James Loomis, a team physician who was part of two championships, a World Series and a Super Bowl. What I found in the locker room was some pretty outdated ideas about nutrition. You would go to a pre-game dinner with the football team and you would see this spread. There would be steak and chicken, very much protein-oriented because their perception was that the protein is what sustains their energy. But in fact, that's not the case. The actual energy for exercise comes mainly from carbohydrates in the form of glycogen that we store in our muscles. And when we sacrifice those carbohydrate calories for protein calories in our diet, what ends up happening is you will develop really chronic carbohydrate or glycogen depletion. And what does that lead to? Well, it leads to chronic fatigue and loss of stamina. I wanted to know how this whole meat gives you energy thing got started and traced it back to the 1800s when a famous German chemist hypothesized that muscular energy came from animal protein and that vegetarians were incapable of prolonged exercise. Liebig's beliefs were so widely accepted that they even inspired the USDA's first protein recommendations. By the time science proved his theory false with the discovery that hardworking muscles run primarily on the carbohydrates found in plants, it was too late. People all around the world had already bought into Liebig's ideas about meat and energy. But not everyone was convinced. As early as 1908, plant-based athletes were starting to claim their first Olympic gold. 
Are you still sticking to your vegetarian diet, Mary? Very rigidly, yes. And do you find that's a benefit to you, do you? Greatly, or I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I changed my diet to a vegan diet, and I set all of my personal bests at 30 years old. The oldest man ever to win a world or Olympic medal. And there were current Olympians, too. Morgan Mitchell is the two-time Australian 400-meter champion. Here comes Morgan Mitchell. Champion. This is very, very fast. It's tough, the 400, I won't lie. The first 200 is pure speed, and then the last 200, it shows who's got that speed endurance training in their legs. And obviously the last 50, you've just got to pray because lactic is hitting hard. You need to be able to hold that endurance. She also represented Australia at the 2016 Summer Olympics. A lot of people had doubted me when I first became vegan, but my energy levels increased incredibly. And my iron, my B12, everything that people said would become deficient were amazing. I thought I'm going to make sure I'm beating them all on the track. I mean, we're all friends, but it was pretty cool to finish my Australian domestic season undefeated. And to win the Nationals was obviously that little cherry on top. Morgan Mitchell, she's tearing away from the field. There was also Dotsy Bausch, an eight-time USA National Cycling Champion and two-time Pan American gold medalist. My event in track cycling requires a massive amount of explosive power. Let's go, ladies. Go, go, go. First of all, we have to get off the line, and we're starting from a dead start with one gear. We have to be able to move that mass, that weight, off the line and get it up to speed within three quarters of the length of the track. My training regimen involved six days a week, climbing mountains up and down for at least four and five hours a day, hard track sessions, and then big gym sessions. I grew up in Kentucky, so that's the land of casseroles and barbecue and meat. So when I transitioned over to an entirely plant-based diet, I wasn't sure if I was gonna survive. And I actually became like a machine. I got up from being able to move about 300 pounds on the inverted leg sled to moving 585 pounds, 60 reps, times five sets. To move that kind of weight, you need more than just energy. You also need strength. In other words, protein. I just couldn't believe that Dotsy, or anyone for that matter, could get enough protein eating only plants. I think one of the biggest misconceptions in sports nutrition is that we have to have animal protein, and in particular meat, to get big and strong and perform at a high level. That's just clearly not true. All that protein that you get when you eat a steak or a hamburger, where did it come from? It came from the plants that the cow ate. I was surprised to learn that all protein originates in plants. Cows, pigs, and chickens, it turns out, are just the middlemen. In fact, the largest study to compare the nutrient intake of meat eaters with plant eaters showed that the average plant eater not only gets enough protein, but 70% more than they need. Even meat eaters like me get roughly half of their protein from plants. But athletes need more protein than most people do. So I crunched the numbers from the study and realized that based on the amount of calories I was eating, I'd still be getting more than enough protein to build and maintain muscle. For example, one cup of cooked lentils or a peanut butter sandwich has about as much protein as three ounces of beef or three large eggs. But what about the quality of the protein? I'd always heard that plant-based protein was inferior. Proteins are strings of amino acids, and there are some amino acids our bodies can't make. Those are the essential amino acids. So we have to get them from food. And one of the arguments about animal-based proteins being superior is that plant-based proteins aren't complete, so you're not gonna get all the amino acids. And that's a fallacy as well. Again, I was surprised to discover that every single plant contains all the essential amino acids in varying proportions. And when it comes to gaining strength and muscle mass, research comparing plant and animal protein has shown that as long as the proper amount of amino acids are consumed, the source is irrelevant. This all sounded great in theory, but all the athletes I'd met so far were pretty lean. If getting lots of protein without animal foods really wasn't an issue, where were all the big guys?
Hendrik Ferris was the only male weightlifter to represent the United States at the 2012 and 2016 Olympic Games. Olympic style weightlifting is going from the ground to overhead in one or two explosive movements, the most explosive movements that can be done. When I made the switch to a plant-based diet, people, they were like, I don't know how you're gonna lift that much weight and you're not gonna be eating anything, you're just gonna eat grass, like how you gonna be strong? I qualified for my third Olympic team, you know what I'm saying? I broke two American records. I won the Pan Am Games. I was like, man, like I think I should have done this a long while ago. Like why didn't I research this before? And Kendrick wasn't alone. 5,000 miles away, I found another strength athlete named Patrick Baboumian. Patrick is one of the strongest men on the planet with multiple world records, including the front hold, the keg lift, and the log lift. How could one of the world's strongest men be so powerful, eating only plants? No meat, no milk, no eggs. Most of the training I do at home because it's just more practical. Someone asked me, how could you get as strong as an ox without eating any meat? And my answer was, have you ever seen an ox eating meat? I stopped eating meat in 2005. Up to that time, I was 105 kilo, and now I'm 130 kilos. Also, at the same time, I set like four world records. So when I stopped eating meat, I got stronger and bigger. Okay, so I just go under here. Okay, yeah. Really take care of your, your back should really be straight. Get up. Get up. At 700 pounds, I could not move the yoke at all. It, it felt like it was bolted to the ground. And that was just his warm-up weight. It's hard to fathom how strong Patrick really is. It's almost superhuman. When I met Patrick, he was training to break the world record for the heaviest weight ever carried by a human being. To break that record, Patrick would have to carry 1,224 pounds. That's the weight of a horse, a distance of 33 feet. The thing with the yoke is, if you really, really go insane with the weight, when you do a step and all the weight is on one leg, it sometimes feels like your bones could just break. It's probably one of the most terrifying things that we do at Strongman events. Here we go! When Nate Diaz stepped into the cage to face Conor McGregor, the Vegas oddsmakers had Diaz as the 4-1 to one underdog. Surprise, motherfuckers. <laughs> it's a bitter, bitter pill to swallow. Um, it was simply a battle of energy in there, and I, and he got the better of that, so. Nine days out from the fight, I started eating two steaks a day, and it just came back to bite me on the ass, you know? This was the greatest upset in UFC history. And it turned out Nate wasn't the only plant-based fighter out there. I stopped eating meat probably like around the end of 2012. I grew up not even knowing about half of these other vegetables. Asparagus to me just came out like five years ago. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, as a kid, it was like, asparagus, we ain't never see that. I'm like, what's that? Bryant Jennings is a heavyweight title contender 
Best known for going the distance with Vladimir Klitschko, one of the greatest boxing champions of all time. My early years growing up in Philly, the only thing we knew was spinach in a can, collard greens, and Popeye's KFC, made by a frying chicken. Most people say, oh, where do you get your protein? As if everybody that's in KFC is looking at the back of a bucket, like, yeah, how much protein? is? Y'all don't know. So y'all don't, y'all really don't know what y'all eating. I'd never really thought about it like that before. What else was in the food I was eating? An experiment to help answer that question was being conducted by Dr. Robert Vogel, co-chair of the NFL's subcommittee on cardiovascular health. What you eat immediately before an athletic endeavor really can have major impact on how you perform. There's a direct correlation between a meal and endothelial function. The endothelium is the lining of blood vessels. It regulates blood flow throughout the body. It knows that a particular muscle group or organ needs more blood flow, and it dilates, it opens up. When the endothelium is impaired, it cannot open up. It cannot allow blood flow to increase as much, and therefore impairs athletic performance. The test subjects were three football players from the Miami Dolphins. Defensive back Michael Thomas, and wide receivers Griff Whalen and Kenny Stills. For the touchdown, Kenny Stills! Today, we're going to be feeding them three burrito breakfasts with a lot of protein. Two of them have sources of animal-based protein and fat. One is from beef, one is from chicken. Third is a plant-based burrito, which has beans in it. So the protein and the fat came from a plant-based source. Tomorrow, we're going to feed them all bean burritos. We're looking at the impact of eating a different meal on the same people. All right, here's the beef. Thank you. Chicken here. I'm going to have a plant-based one here as well. Thank you. Griff has been plant-based for four years, so he got bean burritos on both days. On away games, we always eat fried chicken. We eat Popeyes. <laughs> I love fried chicken. I love Popeyes. And I'm going to eat Popeyes every time. <laughs> Two hours after each meal, the players had their blood drawn and put into a centrifuge. The red blood cells sink to the bottom. An amber-colored fluid called plasma rises to the top. If the plasma is see-through, it means there's not much fat in the blood and the endothelium is likely functioning well. Michael, today's blood and yesterday's blood. This is a plant burrito. This is a meat burrito. Look at the difference it makes in what circulates in your bloodstream. Cloudy. Cloudy. And that's on top is the fat circulating in your blood from the meat burrito. Gotcha. Griff, you're the vegan. Here's your blood from today and your blood from yesterday. Nice and clear, both of them. So the fat from the avocado doesn't have that kind of effect. That's right. Kenny, you're the fried chicken guy. <laughs> You want to see your chicken? There it is. Yeah, it's pretty gross to see. <laughs> Sources of animal-based protein and fat have a tremendous impact on endothelial function that lasts for six or seven hours after you eat. So if you have bacon and eggs for breakfast, or a hamburger for lunch, and a steak for dinner, this is going on all day long. Your blood is always cloudy, and the ability to operate at your best is always impaired. Damn. I guess I won't be eating my fried chicken no more. Dr. Vogel's experiment was backed up by numerous studies measuring how a single animal-based meal can impair blood flow. I also found a large body of research showing that plants have the opposite effect, improving endothelial function and increasing blood flow. Controlled studies show that simply drinking beet juice before training allows subjects to cycle 22% longer and bench press 19% more total weight. I've seen races where it has come down to the 1,000th of a second. Sometimes you have to do things that you know your competitors aren't doing, getting every single advantage you can. Knowing I could get enough energy and protein was one thing, but seeing what a single animal-based meal could do to an athlete's blood sealed the deal. It was time to give this plant-based thing a try, but there was only one meat-free meal I could think of. Hi, what can I get for you today? Could I get two bean burritos, please? Beans? Or beef? Bean. 
Thank you. You're welcome. When I went plant-based, I thought that it would be a longer transition, but I just immediately started feeling like I could go kick ass and not need the recovery in between. It was mind-blowing to my teammates. They were tired of me saying, like, let's go again and again. Recovery is the most essential element of an elite athlete's existence. It's damage repair, damage repair, and you do that over and over again. Because if you can do more work and more repair, you're gonna be the better athlete. Dotsy was right. Bouncing back quickly between workouts is a huge advantage for any athlete. But the idea that food could be the secret weapon, I had to find out more. Dr. Scott Stoll is a former Olympian and a team physician for the USA Olympic team. I work with professional athletes that are very interested in protein. Protein's important, but which package is your protein coming in is the better question to answer. The plant-based protein versus the animal protein, which package is going to help the body overcome inflammation and help the body to recover? In animal products, you're getting protein packaged with inflammatory molecules like new 5 gc endotoxins, and heme iron. When we consume animal products, it also changes the microbiome, the bacteria that live in our gut. And the bacterial species that have been shown to promote inflammation overgrow and begin to produce inflammatory mediators like TMAO. The study that showed that a single hamburger impairs blood flow also showed that it can increase measures of inflammation by 70%. In the arteries, inflammation reduces blood flow. In muscles and joints, it can increase soreness and delay recovery. In plant-based protein, you're getting protein that's packaged with antioxidants, phytochemicals, minerals, and vitamins that are gonna reduce inflammation, optimize the microbiome, optimize blood supply, and optimize your body's performance. The antioxidants Dr. Stoll was talking about are found almost entirely in plants, which have, on average, 64 times the antioxidant content of animal foods. Even iceberg lettuce has more antioxidants than salmon or eggs. As a result, switching to a plant-based diet can help reduce measures of inflammation by 29% in just three weeks. I was about ready to retire as I should have been because I'm like 35 at that time but I just kept getting better, and so they had to take me to the Olympics. <laughs> we were complete underdogs as Team USA. In our semifinal ride against Australia, we were down by 1.7 seconds. No one's ever come back in Team Pursuit from a deficit that large. And we beat them on the line by eight one hundredths of a second. I was 39 and a half years old when I stood on the Olympic podium. I'm still the oldest person, male or female, to even go to the Olympic Games in my event. My diet was the most powerful aspect to me being able to perform and produce for the U.S. team at the Olympic Games. All of these athletes and their stories were impressive, but my goal from the beginning was to recover from actual injuries, like the damage I'd done to my knees. And he's down at the line of scrimmage in the arms of Derek Morgan. Derek Morgan had been on a similar journey. In the NFL, the injury rate is 100%. <laughs> it's a violent game. Hit hard and goes down there. And so how you respond to injury and how quickly you heal from injury is important. Because if you're not on the field, you're not helping the team. I was reading the research and seeing that a plant-based diet could be beneficial specifically for recovery. And so I started incorporating it and I started seeing really good results with it. I was recovering better. I wasn't getting as sore. I was a lot less swollen. Basically to confirm what I was feeling, I got my blood tested. Six months after being on the diet, all of my markers were down, my blood pressure, my cholesterol. But the main thing I was looking at was the inflammation marker in your, in your blood, and mine was almost obsolete. It wasn't there anymore. 
Whole food plant-based diet is gonna optimize the growth of blood vessels leading to damaged tissue. It's gonna lay down new tissue in tendons and muscles. It's gonna stimulate their immune system to fight off infections. So almost at every level, eating the right foods is going to accelerate the healing process. Six weeks into my personal plant-based experiment, I went to the gym to see if I could notice a difference. I wasn't able to spar or wrestle yet, so I decided to hit the battling ropes. At my gym, lasting 10 minutes on the ropes gets your name on the wall. Only a few people had ever hit 20 minutes. Even at the peak of my conditioning, the most I'd ever got was eight minutes. James, keep it going. But on this day, I hit 10 minutes easily. Then I hit 20, 30. You're at 45 minutes. I thought, holy shit, I'm gonna do an hour. I went past the hour mark by about one minute and just thought, all right, that'll do. I can't believe you just did that, man. The only thing that had changed was my diet. I could have kept going. That's <laughs> yeah, the record, right? Yeah. Freaking hour. When I was growing up, the toughest guy in the world to me was my dad. He taught me the value of self-defense and was always there to help me when I got into trouble. But now, he was the one who needed help. So you had a heart attack? Correct. Had you had much in the way of symptoms prior to this episode? No, never before. The first... After my dad got out of the hospital following emergency heart surgery, we got on a Skype call with Dr. Coldwell Esselstyn, an internationally renowned heart disease researcher from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we've been, I think, very fit. So somewhat of a surprise. Well, no, not a surprise. In all of Western civilization, there is nothing more common than coronary artery heart disease. And that is because of the foods that most people eat every day. Do you happen to recall into which of your arteries did they place the stent? Was it into the left anterior descending or the right? After seeing how much a single animal-based meal can affect healthy young athletes, I couldn't help but wonder what a lifetime of these foods might have done to my father's heart. In all of our studies, we found the same thing. These same biological mechanisms that affect performance also affect our health. Chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, and endothelial function. When you eat animal products, you start to form plaques in the coronary arteries. Plaque formation in the arteries doesn't just limit the function of the arteries. It can also block the blood flow. And that's when the heart starts to have some real problems keeping up with the demands of the body. In terms of heart disease, oftentimes there's confusion. People think that, well, I don't eat red meat, so I'm okay. We know that it's more complicated than that. It's not just red meat. It's not just the fat. For nearly 50 years, we were told that the primary cause of heart disease was saturated fat and cholesterol, and that leaner meats, lower fat dairy products, and egg whites were the solution. But the research now shows that the other inflammatory compounds in animal foods, like those that can impair athletic recovery, also play a significant role in the development of heart disease. We're gonna do a whole lot better by just getting rid of the animal products. And there are really good biochemical reasons for that. Heme iron is one of them, for example. Heme iron is from an animal source, right? So uh, most commonly you think red meat, even though poultry have it, fish has it. They did a meta-analysis looking over six prospective dietary studies, over 130,000 patients, and they came to the conclusion that one milligram a day of heme iron is associated with a 27% increasing risk of coronary heart disease. To put that in perspective, an average hamburger patty has about two to three milligrams. And it isn't just the iron in animal foods that can cause problems. It's actually the animal protein itself. It's not just red meat, not just chicken, not just eggs, not just milk. It's the ingestion of any animal protein. At that moment in time, a process begins at a chemical level inside the body. When the protein found in animal foods is cooked, preserved, or even just digested by our gut bacteria, highly inflammatory compounds are formed that corrode our cardiovascular system. This helps explain why people who get all of their protein from plants reduce their risk of heart disease by 55%.
It would also help explain why the only diet that has ever been shown to actually reverse heart disease is a plant-based one. What we found is that in the first month, there was improvement in blood flow and the heart began to pump blood more normally. After a year, even severely clogged coronary arteries became measurably less clogged and even more improvement after five years. But in the randomized control group who were doing just what their doctors told them to do at the time, you know, less red meat, more fish and chicken, little exercise and so on, their arteries got more clogged after one year and even more clogged after five years. While all of this sounded promising, my dad didn't just need to get better, he needed to get better fast. The stents in his heart were only a temporary solution. He could have another heart attack at any moment. I found some hope at a firehouse in Brooklyn, where Dr. Esselstyn's son Rip, a former firefighter and professional triathlete, was launching some of New York's bravest on a powerful new program. What's the number one killer of firefighters in the line of duty? heart attacks. 67% of firefighters who perish from the line of duty die of heart attacks. So this right here, that is what we call a healthy artery. The blood can flow through this huge opening here, and this is what happens after decades on the meat and dairy diet. Okay? If you guys have been eating this way, I want you to take the seven-day rescue challenge. We bought you guys plant-based groceries. I want you to give yourselves the chance to see what your internal biochemistry does in just seven days. My, my cholesterol is elevated. My LDLs are always very high. The same job that I was doing like 10 years ago without an effort, yeah. without taking an effort. Despite working out all week, playing sports, my cholesterol is high and growing by about 10, 15 points every year for the last five or six years. I realized a couple salads a week, it doesn't really cut it. We got two kids. You know, so uh, hopefully I'll feel better, have more energy, and uh, add some years to my life. I went to see if I could get my dad to make these same changes to his diet as soon as possible. Well, what are you suggesting? Well, let's do the shopping. Tomatoes, <laughs> cucumber, we have hummus dips. But my dad can be a little stubborn. Soya yogurt, and that's about it, I think. So I wasn't feeling that hopeful. We're just drink tea. I come from a town called Melton Mowbray, known in England as the rural capital of food. It's the home of Stilton cheese and the world famous Melton Mowbray pork pie. The pace of change here is very slow. And my dad, like most of us, is a product of where he grew up. I just couldn't imagine someone as set in his ways as my father, making such a big switch. Until I got home and went back to the gym. I've spent years working out with Lucius Smith. He was a cornerback in the NFL, has a black belt in jiu-jitsu, and was my strength and conditioning coach. That's it, that's it, that's it. More arms, more arms. I told Lou about the research I'd been doing and what happened to my dad. And he'd never mentioned this before, and he said, I've been on a plant-based diet for almost 10 years. Lou is 60 years old, not far off my father's age. Most guys my age can keep up with the grandchildren. My grandchildren can't keep up with me. When I went from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet, my blood pressure went down to like 110 over 70. My heart rate, sometimes it's been under 50, like 48, 47. I'm more focused, I'm more relaxed, and I noticed that I have a lot more energy because of the plant-based diet. Come on, come on, man, come on, come on, come on. People in their 20s, they come in here. We do a workout. I sustain the workout a lot easier than they do. We can come in here and do 800. Listen to what I just said. 800 kettlebell swings and snatches in one workout. They can't make it. I'm not kidding you. They can't hang, man, I'm telling you. They can't hang. There was another guy my dad's age who had also made a big change. I ate a lot of meat. I ate my 10, 15 eggs a day. 
and uh, you know, had my 250 grams of protein a day because I weighed 250 pounds. One and only Arnold Schwarzenegger. But as I got older and as I started reading up on it, I recognized the fact that you really don't have to get your protein from meat or from animals, as far as that goes. So we started going more in the direction of a vegetarian kind of a diet. Now we're doing it the right way with the right spices. All of a sudden, I love it much more than the meat. And, uh, you know, the cholesterol went down to around 109. It was the lowest that it ever was in my entire life at almost 69. What we eat has a major impact on our health and our well-being in every way we can measure. People who eat a diet that's high in animal protein have a 75% increased risk of premature death from all causes and a four to 500% increased risk of death from most forms of cancer, prostate, breast, colon cancer, as well as type two diabetes. The amino acids that come from animal sources tend to make our cells rev up and multiply faster. For example, there is accumulating evidence that high consumption of proteins from dairy sources is related to a higher risk of prostate cancer that chain of cancer causation actually seems pretty clear. Cancer has been linked to other animal foods as well. Research funded by the National Cancer Institute found that vegetarians who add one or more servings per week of white meat like chicken or fish more than triple their risk of colon cancer. So it's not one set of dietary guidelines for improving your performance as an athlete, another one for reversing heart disease, a different one for reversing diabetes, a different one for reversing prostate cancer. It's the same for all of them. As groundbreaking as all of this nutritional science was, I also found it really confusing. How could meat be so bad for us if that's what our ancestors were supposedly built to eat? When we think about the diet of early humans, we're often drawn to thinking about meat, but plant foods were more important than the archeological record gives credit for. The food that could be relied on wherever you were was the plant food. The popular perception of what early humans ate dates back to the 1930s and 1940s when there was some amazing finds of early human ancestors, animal bones and tools that very much looked like they may have been used to butcher and maim those animals. So very early on, we had this notion that meat had a disproportionately larger role in the diet of early human ancestors than it actually did. The bias in the archaeological record towards stone and bone preservation over things like plants has led to a very skewed view. If we look at deep time, bones and stone tools preserve very well, but plants decay very rapidly. What's exciting, though, is in the last decade, we've started to realize microscopic fossils of plants do preserve quite well. And so we're revisiting some of these earlier Paleolithic sites and finding abundant evidence of plants. Advanced technologies, like those used to analyze the gladiator bones, have allowed scientists to take a closer look at the tools, bones, and teeth of our ancestors, leading to the discovery that early humans ate mostly plants. And the reason for this is actually quite simple. Humans do not have any specialized genetic, anatomical, or physiological adaptations to meat consumption. By contrast, we have many adaptations to plant consumption. We have longer digestive tracts than do carnivores, and this allows humans to digest plants and fibers that require longer processing time. We also lack the ability to produce our own vitamin C. Vitamin C is found in plants, so the fact that we cannot make our own indicates just how reliant upon plants we actually are. This is why we have trichromatic vision. This is very different from carnivores, which have dichromatic vision. We can see more colors, and this is very important, especially if you need to find fresh, ripe fruit. We have a brain that just is desperate for glucose. It's a, I mean, it's such a fussy organ. That's the only thing it really takes in for energy. Well, meat's not a very good source of glucose. To have a big brain like this, you need to eat something different. And the most efficient way to get glucose is to eat carbohydrates. But what about our teeth? Aren't they proof that we're built to eat meat? In primates, you might think canine teeth are associated with a diet of meat, but they're not. In gorillas, when males want to intimidate other males, they will show the length of their formidable canines. On the other hand, carnivores have distinctive teeth, and they're shaped like scissor blades. 
they simply shred the meat off and they swallow. Compare that to the teeth of a human being, square and low cusp for crushing and grinding tough plant tissues. Right there in your own mouth is the best evidence we have for a diet that could not have been meat. If you just got placed in some ancestral environment, the best thing you could be equipped with is not a very sharp spear. The most important thing you could be equipped with is knowledge of which plants you can eat. Suddenly it all made sense. The reason an animal-based diet isn't good for us is because our bodies aren't built for it. It's simply the wrong type of fuel. The only thing that didn't really fit was B12, an important vitamin that everyone kept warning me you could only get from animal foods. It turns out that B12 isn't made by animals after all. It's made by bacteria that these animals consume in the soil and water. Just like with protein, animals are only the middlemen. Before industrial farming, farm animals and humans could get B12 by eating traces of dirt on plant foods or by drinking water from rivers or streams. But now, because pesticides, antibiotics, and chlorine kill the bacteria that produce this vitamin, even farm animals have to be given B12 supplements. And up to 39% of people tested, including meat eaters, are low in B12. As a result, the best way for humans to get enough B12, whether they eat animal foods or not, is simply to take a supplement. When I caught up with Scott a full month into his 2200 mile trek, he had fallen well behind record pace. Not even a week into the journey, I developed a quadricep tear. I had to start thinking, okay, how am I going to get through this? There are no rest days when you're setting a speed record on the Appalachian Trail. I needed to recover while I was still pushing my body to the brink. Waking up the next day and the next day after that and doing the same thing. I really had to trust in my training and trust in my nutrition to help me get up each morning at 4.30 and put another 50 miles in. With only 12 days left to break the record, Scott still had 550 miles left to go. They were experiencing record rainfall in Vermont when I went through, and there's just no way that I could be prepared for it. I was trying to make up all the ground that I'd lost with the injury, trying to get back on record pace, getting two to three hours of sleep or less, night after night after night, going over some of the most remote stretches I put in 26 hours straight. But the Appalachian Trail keeps throwing more and more mountains at you. It never really lets up. And by the time I actually got to New Hampshire, the White Mountains just obliterated me. With less than two weeks remaining, Patrick continued training for his world record attempt to carry more weight than anyone in history. I started lifting weights when I was 14 years old because I was kind of wimpy and, and small in that time. And I wanted to be some kind of hero, able to help if something happened. This is my mom and dad. When I was four years old, my dad, my mom, and my little sister, she was six months old, they were in a car accident. And only my mom survived the accident. So when I was young, I had these fantasies of uh, being super strong, and if someone got trapped, being able to help them get out. For any guy watching that day, it wasn't just a car Patrick had crushed. It was a myth they'd been fed their entire lives. A steak, that's what a man eats. Made from stuff guys need. Eat like a man, man. There's no one that can relate to that better than I do because I've lived in that world. Steak is for man. Go me! 
They showed us commercials, burgers, George Foreman with the grill. Yeah. And the big sandwiches and all that stuff. Eat like a man and be full like a man. This is great, great marketing by the meat industry. Serious man food. Selling that idea that real men eat meat. You look like more of a man with a quarter pounder in your hand. But you got to understand, that's marketing. That's not based on reality. Okay, I'm going to take you down to the exam room. When I think of a manly man, I think of somebody who has strength, endurance, sexual prowess, and fertility. And in fact, what the scientific studies are showing is that the more meat men eat, the more quickly they lose their manly manhood. The blood test with the Miami Dolphins measured how a single meal could affect blood flow throughout the entire body. I asked Dr. Spitz if he could conduct an experiment with three collegiate athletes, but this time on a more specific part of the male anatomy. So, <laughs> here's a model of a penis. Dr. Spitz is the lead delegate of urology for the American Medical Association. When it comes to the penis, he literally wrote the book. Now, you're going to be putting this device on yourself. One ring goes on the base of the penis, and the other ring goes on at the tip of the penis, just behind the head of the penis, but knows how tight to squeeze to know when an erection is starting, because when it squeezes, it'll determine, oh, it's now of a larger circumference. Something's happening. What we're going to look at is what effect the meal you have has on your erections that night, and you're going to be eating two different kinds of meals. For this study, on the first night, we gave the guys burritos that had meat, beef, chicken, pork, but really high quality meats, grass fed, organic. On the second night, we gave them very similar burritos, but we swapped out the animal portions for plant-based protein. That's really good. I thought this was gonna be nasty, I'm not gonna lie. I didn't think we were gonna eat a burrito, I thought we were gonna get a salad. <laughs> <laughs> This study is going to take advantage of a natural function that occurs in men when they sleep. Men's bodies create erections, and this occurs throughout the night while the subject is asleep. And once an erection happens, this device can sense it, and a printout is generated of how firm the erection was, how long it lasted, and how many of them there were, to see if we can see a physical effect on erections as a result of what they just ate for dinner. This is where we uh, take a look at the results. So Mason, I'm gonna give you your results first. Let you take those out. Okay. The bigger the circumference, the harder the erection. And so you'll notice that that first circle, which is the, the meat meal, mm -hmm. is not as big a circle, it's not as hard an erection <laughs> as that second circle, the vegan meal. Now let's look at the second sheet. The second sheet is a, a accumulation of how many erections and for how long you had over the course of the night. So that first stubby graph <laughs> is really, it's not the oh, size of your fetus. <laughs> I'm struggling. It's not the size of your fetus. It's how, how many minutes throughout the night you had erection. Wow. Blake, let's take a look at your results. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Hold composure. And look, again. Like Mason, uh, you were more erect after the plant-based diet than the meat-based diet. Okay, how about how often you had erections? Oh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's almost a 500% difference. Dang, man. That's crazy. Blake, you ready for yours? You All so right, much. here you go. <laughs> you had about a 13% change in the hardness of your erections. Okay, let's look at how many or how long you had erections for. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Show it, dang it. Yeah, don't hold that up. <laughs> bro, that's an hour, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys all had a very similar response to the meat meal versus the plant meal. That's crazy. Yeah, growing up, but if I saw some big dude at a restaurant eating a big old steak, and so I'm like, oh, I, I need to be like that. And then like I see like a guy ordering a salad off the menu, I'm like, he saw it, right? Yeah, I'm like, oh, that guy, <laughs> yeah, what he is he saw doing? It. But really, at yeah. the end of the night, the guy eating the big steak is soft, and then the other guy is <laughs> 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 <it's> a heart. <laughs>